seen that in piping systems, there are radial stresses, which are often neglected, axial stresses, the hoop stress and the torsion stress, which is a shear stress. So if we evaluate the stress state at a location in the material, we find that this stress state is determined by these stresses from the multiple directions. So they form a three-dimensional stress state. We've also seen that for uniaxial stress tests, so a simple test element with a force applied in the axial direction, we typically find the following stress strain curve from which we can deduce possible limits for the material stresses. The first limit would be the yield stress to make sure that no plastic deformation of the pipe would take place. The second limit would be the ultimate tensile strength to make sure that no rupture of the pipe takes place. However, these limits are found for stresses in only one direction, so from a one-dimensional stress state. So if we find the limits from a 1D stress state, how can we evaluate the 3D stress state in the piping? One might think that we can just check if each stress direction complies with the limits, but this is incorrect since the stress in one direction can influence the margin available for stresses in another direction. So how to combine the stress directions for one overall compliance check. In order to answer this question, we take a closer look at the 3D stress state in the material. We consider a small cube of the material at an arbitrary location. On this cube, the radial stress applies, the axial stress and also the hoop stress. We again see that the stress state is three-dimensional. We consider thin walled piping so we can neglect the radial stresses. As a result, we end up with a two dimensional stress state, which we visualize from the side. Next to the axial and hoop stress, we also consider the torsion stress for our cube. Now remember, the axial and hoop stress are normal stresses that work perpendicular to the surfaces and tend to stretch the cube and the torsion stress is a shear stress that works parallel to the surfaces and tends to deform the cube. For our cube, we define the vertical direction as the y direction and the horizontal direction as the x direction. The related stresses are called sigma x and sigma y for the normal stresses and tau xy or tau yx for the shear stresses. Now it is important to realize that our assessment of the stresses at this location should be independent of the orientation of our cube. So if we would have chosen the cube under a different angle, it still represents the same three-dimensional stress state at the same location in the pipe. No matter how we rotate and orient our cube, we should still be able to combine the stress directions and be able to check compliance against the limits. But if we rotate the cube, there is a shift between the normal stress components and shear stress components. Components that work perpendicular to the surface in one orientation are not perpendicular anymore if the cube is rotated. This is typically visualized using a plot that shows the shear stress on the cube on the vertical axis and the normal stresses on the cube on the horizontal axis. Let's say the cube is oriented such that all stresses work perpendicular to the surfaces. This situation can be visualized in the plot by two points on the horizontal axis. One point for the stresses in the x direction and one point for the stresses in the y direction. Both points are located on the horizontal axis because we've oriented the cube such that there are no shear stresses working on the cube. If we now rotate the cube, the stresses are no longer completely perpendicular to the surfaces. The stresses now also have a component parallel to the surfaces of the cube which form a shear stress. The stresses at both surfaces now form new points in the graphs. 
these new points are no longer on the horizontal axis because there is a shear stress available. If we rotate the cube even more, two new points are found in the graph. As it turns out, if we rotate the cube, the points on the graph form a circle, which is called Morse circle. In summary, if we evaluate the stress state at one specific location, we can use a cube to define the stresses at this location. But we can use any possible orientation of the cube to do this. More circle, which shows the shear stresses on the cube plotted against the normal stresses, is a means to visualize the different stresses on our cube for different orientations. In more circle, we can define three distinctive locations. First of all, both points where the circle and the horizontal axis meet. And second of all, the point of maximum shear stress. The first two points are called the principal stresses, S1 and S2. These principal stresses are the stress values if the cube is oriented such that no shear stress is present on the cube surfaces. The third point is called the point of maximum shear stress, tau max. For this point, the cube is oriented such that the shear stress is maximized. These three points can be calculated from the stresses working on the cube, sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy, regardless of the cube's orientation. So no matter how we orient the cube, as long as we know the normal and shear stresses on the cube surfaces, sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy, we can calculate the principal stresses and maximum shear stress. And it are these three points that characterize the 3D stress state independent of the cube orientation. So once we calculated the principal stresses S1 and S2 and the maximum shear stress tau max, we have characterized the stress state at the location of the cube independent of the cube's orientation. In the next video we will see how the principal stresses and maximum shear stress values are important to evaluate the 3D stress state against the limits found in a uniaxial tension test. Music